Good morning and welcome to worship on this chilly January morning. I'm not sure how the rest of you are doing, but um, I'm really excited because I need bread today. So I get to go to a grocery store on the way home. That's how desperate I am to get out of the house. So I hope the rest of you are hanging in there. This isn't a lot of fun for sure, but we're doing the best we can. I will admit that I spent the day Wednesday glued to the TV, like um, many of you, I'm sure, and then again Thursday to watch the prayer service from the Washington Cathedral. And I had my computer in front of me jotting down notes from the speeches and prayers and sermon. So some phrases might sound familiar to you today, and um, yes, they did come from those events on Wednesday. Our opening hymn reminds us that the voice of our Lord calls us not only to seek refuge and rest, but then to reach out to the world with hope. Hymn number 626, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. So come now to reflect once again on God's call and to ponder the multitude of ways in which God calls us and the variety of tasks awaiting our energy and skill. Let us pray. Time and time again, O God, you have called your people to follow you. Jesus constantly challenged those he met to leave their lives behind in order to follow him. And today, your restless spirit of hope and truth 
continues to call us through those nudges deep down inside, but also through those brave souls you have already called to leadership in your church and your world. Remind us when others challenge us that the real call comes not from them, but from you, a God who still longs for faithful followers to do the good work of his kingdom. God knows all of the usual answers we give time and time again. Life is busy. I'm not up to the task. I'm a follower, not a leader. I don't need more responsibility. On and on the excuses go, but God never stops calling, longing for all of us to commit ourselves to faithful service. How fortunate are we that God thinks us fit for the task. This morning, we continue the theme of God's call, <clears throat> reading from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter. And I just need to warn you, Mark does not use any extra words to get his point across. So don't snooze or you'll miss the Gospel reading today. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Through these words, God's voice is heard. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. Gracious God, we do indeed pray for you to rain down upon us and upon your world your love and your spirit of hope for the future. We ask, O oh God, as always, that you would open our ears to hear your call and open our hearts to respond to it. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. So I've been um, thinking over the past few weeks as we've been reading about the theme of call, been thinking a lot about my own life and answering the call to ministry. And I think that I knew from a young age that I was called to this work. But the honest truth is I really didn't want to answer the call. I watched my dad go back to university in his 40s to answer the call to ministry. And I saw what it did to our family to pick up our roots and travel, so to speak, to a new land. I remember things like my sadness when my dad was at a church meeting instead of taking a picture of me all dressed up for my high school prom. I knew what it felt like when the rest of the world was enjoying long weekends together as a family while we were going to church. I watched as our donations to the church never wavered, but there was no extra money for things that kids think they need, toys, clothes. I remember seeing my dad return from board meetings at the church too fired up to sleep when controversial issues were on the table. And I remember us laughing at the breakfast table when our mom would tell us that he was tossing and turning while he dreamt at night, saying out loud, idiots, idiots, it's idiots in our language. I had no desire to follow in those footsteps, really. But the call persisted, and here I am. And I, too, have tossed and turned many nights over strained relationships in the congregation, over personal feedback received, over the multitude of things that can be stressful when you have a lot of folk who, for some reason, are not always like-minded and don't always see things your way. And yes, it has been hard to raise a family without ever spending Christmas Eve with them, missing soccer games and other important occasions in their life. But you know what? I don't regret answering the call. And I am so grateful for those who took me aside in my growing up years to tell me that if I hadn't heard the call, they knew it was there. Because looking back now, I realize that aside from the call that comes from that place deep down inside of us that I talked about last week, sometimes the call also comes from other people speaking the truth to us, truth we don't always want to hear. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Now, I have to say, if I were poor old Zebedee, I'd be a little ticked off when my sons just dropped their nets and took off, leaving me to finish the day's work. But you have to admit that whatever course Jesus took in recruiting, it was obviously a good one because apparently people just dropped everything. No going home to consult with family, no counting the cost or sleeping on it. They just dropped everything and followed. 
Now, I feel I have to tell you that in Mark's gospel, everything happens immediately. There's a sense of urgency with Mark. So we probably shouldn't get too tied up with the fact that things happen so quickly with the response to Jesus' call. But still, regardless of how long it took, it seemed to work. And I think there's probably a reason for that, because even as it began, Jesus' ministry produced results. The blind regained their vision. The lame walked. Justice was restored. Healing was plentiful. Good works were evident for all to see. And so people were willing to invest, willing to commit, willing to follow. Some important things there, I think, for us to ponder. Let me tell you, if there is one soul-destroying task of ministry, it actually has to be that of trying to convince people to take on leadership roles in the church. Yes, we have a nominating team, but yes, as a minister, there's also no escaping your own role in encouraging people to step up to the plate. I say it's soul-destroying work because people get confused about who is really doing the asking, and we probably make the mistake ourselves of not being clear about that. John Ball and I were talking this week about the fact that people of faith used to consider whatever they chose to do in life as a vocation, as a calling. So being called was not just a privilege or responsibility bestowed upon clergy. Everyone sought out their unique call in order to know their life's purpose. And we've lost that sense, I think. And listen, even our church has greatly changed its expectation of what it means for clergy to answer the call. I still remember the day that we spent literally sitting beside the phone, waiting for the call from the Transfer and Settlement Committee of the National Church because when that call came, you were told where you were going to live for the next three years. Because wherever the needs of the church matched the skills you had already developed in your years of student ministry, that's where you would be. Now, to be honest, really what it was all about was finding some poor student to head out to some remote part of Canada where a church couldn't entice a minister otherwise, either because of lack of funds or because the closest grocery store was about 200 kilometers away. Now maybe I exaggerate a bit, but boy, those were the days when you knew exactly what following the call meant. You went where the church needed you, often far away from family and friends. Life has changed. Ministry has changed. The world has changed, but I believe the call of God continues. We have just become sidetracked by the busyness of our own lives, And self-sacrifice, for some reason, is not as popular as it used to be. And so while last week I urged you to pay attention to that nudging deep down inside, which I believe is one of the ways in which the Spirit of God calls faithful people to service, I would ask you today to listen for the call of God as it comes through those of us tasked with calling you to service here and now. 
This past year, with all of its challenges, has also, in many ways, been deeply fulfilling and exciting. I will never forget the first Sunday when we went live with Cindy's cell phone clipped onto a little stand in the middle aisle. I think all of us were holding our collective breath, waiting to see if we could really do this. And here we are almost a year later with a far superior product. We've had some great Zoom chats. We've enjoyed some great programming over Zoom, amazing music. We've continued to reach out to our community, perhaps even more strongly than in the past. We're working really hard so that when people look our way, they will see the good work. They will know that we are following the way of our Lord. I don't know even what the call of God is going to entail for me over the coming year because we've all just learned to go with the flow. But I do believe that through all of this, God is calling us, each and every one of us, to something new and something exciting. So in slightly altered words that have inspired many in the past, I would simply say to all of you as we work together to build a strong future, ask not what your church can do for you, but rather what you can do for your church. Thanks be to God for constantly calling us forward to new possibilities in service to him and to the world.
I see a new heaven and a new earth. I think that's sort of how we were all feeling this week as we watched the uh, events unfold in the U.S. This morning as I arrived, I just checked the boxes of food that we have in Les Call left over from our December delivery to Kerr Street. And I thought how wonderful it is that we haven't been asked yet to deliver those extra groceries. And the reason I find that so wonderful is because it shows the abundance of goodwill that has surfaced in our community and our world throughout this pandemic. And I hope and trust that when this is over that none of us will forget the importance of reaching out with our time, our talent, our money, our resources to enable this church to carry on its ministry and to make this community and this world a better place. dedicate ourselves and all that we have and are able to the work of your kingdom here on earth, O God. Bless us and all we offer in Jesus' name. Amen. So I, I should mention I'm not able to um, chat with you uh, online today because I had a little uh, construction accident, very tiny with my thumb, but it happens to be my texting thumb and it's very frustrating. But I should say to each of you, it's really wonderful when you sign on on Sunday morning and let um, us know you're worshiping with us because we then can picture your faces and it's almost as good as seeing you sitting here in the pew. So thank you to those who let us know that you're worshiping with us and provide feedback throughout the service. We um, once again gather in prayer as we uh, come before God sharing the deepest longings and thoughts of our soul and our heart. And again, all of the words in this prayer this morning are not mine. You'll probably recognize some of them from this week. Let us pray. God, as you call us, each one of us to follow, we acknowledge that united in spirit and purpose, we can do great things. We come with hope and with our eyes raised anew to a more perfect union between you, us, and all who seek the welfare of humanity. As caring for one another in word and deed, especially the less fortunate among us, we become a light to the world. Dreams are built together as we follow the call and commit ourselves with resolve to a way of justice, forgiveness, and peace. Be with us, holy mystery of love, as we dream and work together, for we wish the dream of justice for all to be deferred no longer. Our whole soul is in it, and with all of our being, we turn from what was to follow the vision of what can be. We will lead not by the example of our power, but by the power of our example, living in the shadow of God's love and grace. And in this season of Epiphany, as always, we remember there is always light if we're only brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. 
In Jesus' name, we offer all of these prayers as we pray with one voice, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So Jesus continues to ask simply, will you come and follow me? Hymn number 567. forth now remembering that no matter what your age no matter what your circumstances you are called you are called by God to a ministry of hope love and peace and remember that the God who calls you is the God who walks always by your side offering hope courage and strength for the journey mm -hmm. 